Right, you guys this episode 49 of inner demons and without further ado you already know i'm gonna get straight to it but check it out real quick before i do let me just say this real quick so i want to extend our appreciation to each and every one of you that have been dropping positive comments you know there's a lot of you that have been giving the channel a lot of praise and you know i'm always going through the comments i try to answer as many as i can obviously i can't answer all of you but it doesn't mean that i don't see you guys i see all the comments and we appreciate it you know whether it's our presentation, the time and detail that we put into our craft, whether it's the content or just the fact that this is a grown up channel and we stay out of the drama. You know, we're going to stay sidelined and we're going to let the clowns be clowns. The only thing that we're focused on over here is trying to better the content, trying to make this a better channel. That's it. That's all. Anyways, let me get straight to it. So, as I do with every episode, I always watch the last episode to try to help remind me of where I was at or where I left off. Last thing I want to do or what I try to avoid is talking about what I've already talked about. I've been spanked in the comments before for that. So <laughs> I learned my lesson anyway. So at the end of the last episode, I told you guys I got the directive from leadership to relocate. And, you know, as I was saying in the last episode, Relocating, it's not an easy task. It's it's a lot of work. I'm sure you guys know, you know, how much work it is to move an entire household, all your furniture, to have to shut down all the electricity, garbage, PG and E water and all that stuff, and turn your cable on and do all that. It literally takes two, three weeks, you know, of work to do all that stuff. So, you know, it's not like we just jumped up and moved from one day to the next. It took about three weeks to make that transition, but we got it done. You know, I got that trans, I got that directive, and as soon as I got it, like I said, I sat Vicky down. And I told her, "Look, I don't got a choice. It's not something that I can debate. They want me to relocate to San Jose. There's some stuff I need to take care of out there." And she understood. She didn't like it. I knew she didn't like it, but she would never say nothing. She understood that when we got involved that I was already obligated. I had certain obligations that I, I told her about. You know, there were certain things that I was obligated to. There was, you know, I was going to be living a different type of lifestyle than what she was used to. And I wasn't willing to compromise that. And if it was too much, I understood, you know, if she didn't want to, you know, be in that kind of relationship. But she did. You know, she she said she she understood and this was a sacrifice that she was making. So she really didn't say too much. You know, I felt bad because all her family lived out there in Ukiah. Her son was living out there in Ukiah still, you know, with her dad. They basically stayed in her apartment, took it over. And, you know, we cut Trey. We moved out to San Jose. He could have came with us, but, you know, he was going to school out there and everything. He was deeply rooted in Ukiah. I, I don't believe he had ever lived anywhere else. So. He was 18 years old. He just turned 18 and that's where he wanted to stay anyway. So, you know, we ended up making the move. We got out there and I want to say for like the first two or three weeks, all we really did was kick it with JLo. Now, the complex that we moved into, it was a two story complex. You had upstairs and the downstairs. JLo lived on the downstairs, one of the downstairs corner apartments, and we got one of the upstairs far corner apartments, like literally on, on, on the end. So, you know, we'd have to go downstairs to kick it with her, but it was like basically in the daytime over there, everybody kept their doors open and there was like a little courtyard where it was always full of kids, kids playing, bouncing the balls off my wall. You know, they made the old man and me come out all the time. I was always out there hit my damn wall with them damn balls, man. Anyway, so that's what we did for the first two or three weeks. We stayed 
down there with J-Lo, pretty much, you know, chopping it up with her. And I, I spent a lot of time trying to catch up with her and discuss things that I needed to discuss, who she knew, who I could get a hold of. A lot of times we'd be, you know, on the phone trying to get a hold of certain individuals that were out there. And, you know, then me and Vicky were just, we would spend the next two, three weeks trying to just familiarize ourselves with that area. I used to get lost in San Jose all the time. It's a big area. A matter of fact, I think it might be a little bit bigger than Frisco. So, you know, just finding our way to Walmart, just finding our way to, you know, the freeway, some of the shortcuts out there. You guys know how it is. When you move to a new area, you try to familiarize yourself with the back streets and all that stuff. So that's what we did for like the first two or three weeks. Now, let me just back up a little bit. Now, I told you guys all this stuff that happened in the previous episode, you know, the stuff with Caja, Mark Rodriguez. And the reason why I'm bringing that up is because a lot of that stuff was still in the air. As far as leadership, they wanted to know a little bit more about what had happened with that situation, because as I told you guys, we had gave another brother our word that we would take care of the individual that was basically going to, you know, put the nails in his coffin. Homeboy was already stretched out. I'm not going to say his name because I know that he taps in from time to time and he's the type of cat that doesn't wish to be mentioned. He's no longer active, but, you know, a lot of people don't like being on social media or being talked about on social media. They don't like even, you know, having their picture on there, which is understandable. So anyway, that situation, um, you know, that was one situation that came up again. Then, you know, I told you guys also about how, you know, I went out there to Selena's to deal with that situation with Bubba, him getting shot at and. You know, that was kind of a it was kind of a wake up call as well, because even though I was only gone for four days and even though, like I just told you guys, Vicky understood the, the type of things that I would be getting into, although she knew I was involved in a criminal type of lifestyle. She hoped that, you know, obviously I wouldn't get caught up. But during those four days, you know, I got into a I got into a high speed chase a couple drive-bys and some other stuff that happened out there. So she wanted me to stay around her as much as possible. And I think those four days that I went out there, it kind of, it was a wake up call for her. You know, she, she kind of felt like she was going to lose me. She kept telling me that. And I kept telling her, I'm not going to go nowhere. You know, I got this all figured out. I'm a step ahead of the game. You know, I can see him coming. I'm laced up as far as I'm street savvy and all that. You know, when we're out there running around and we're out there doing our dirt and we're ripping and running and running the muck, we think we're we're smarter than the streets sometimes. We think we got law enforcement beat and, you know, basically we're inevitable. You know that or I don't think that's the word inevitable We're What's the word I'm thinking of? Uh, I can't even think of your name right now. You're always in the comments on my lives. Anyways, basically somebody that, that you know, won't get caught. We think that we're not indestructible, but whatever it is, you guys know what I'm saying. You know, we think that we're not going to get touched out there. And that's not always the case. It always ends up, you know, you, you end up thinking that and then you end up getting caught up and you're like damn man you know I should have listened to my instincts right I should have listened to that sixth sense but you know I didn't I kept on doing what I was doing and really I didn't have a choice you know later on you guys will hear about situations where I seen th these guys coming I knew law enforcement was coming and I had a chance an opportunity a blessing a gift to possibly you know, get out or not, 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 not as far as dropping out of the NF, but as far as like just stepping back for a minute and letting things cool down. And maybe I wouldn't have got busted. Maybe things would have been a little bit different. Maybe none of that stuff would have happened. It probably would have happened later because, you know, I've said this before too. When you're involved in that lifestyle, and this is something that I was told when I made my commitment to the NF, you're gonna, there's only, a couple roads you're going to travel. 
So nobody lasts, nobody lasts that long anymore. You know, you might last four or five, six months. You might even last a year. But eventually somebody's going to tell on you. Shit, they told on me. It, it happens. Sooner or later, it's going to happen. So either you're going to end up spending the rest of your life in prison for killing somebody or for just catching the case, getting caught up in, in an indictment, or you're going to end up dying. Somebody's going to end up taking you out. That's the only, those are the only two roads you're going to travel as far as being an active gang member, being an active member of a criminal organization. I never looked at myself as a gang member. So, you know, the other one that they don't tell you, the other possibility is you dropping out, you defecting. So those are the only things that are going to happen anyway. So I kind of, I knew this, I knew it from the day I made a commitment. So anyway, you know, like I was saying, those those couple of days were a wake up call. I couldn't stop doing what I had to do. You know, everything that, you know, my directives had to go on. I had a I had to establish that regiment. I had a lot of work that I needed to do out there in San Jose. So like I was saying, those first three weeks were spent around J-Lo and just getting familiar with that area right there. You know, I, I didn't have to move too fast. Those brothers over there knew how you know, something like this takes, it takes some time. You don't just go out. That's how you get busted. If you go out there and you're moving too fast, you're making mistakes, you're going to get busted like that. So I always took my time. I, I would go out there to a new area. I would do, do my recon. I check out the area. I familiarize myself with the area, just like I did with Salinas, just like I did with out there in Mendocino County. It's the same way I did in Santa Clara. You know, I, I checked the area out. i you know, familiarize myself with the hoods out there, the different hoods, what spots were hot spots. And then once I once I was through with the security part of it, then I do my grunt work as far as knocking on doors, you know, tracking people down, trying to get homeboys to work with me. You know, a lot a lot of the times I, you know, end up going to homeboys' houses and I'd be sitting in their living rooms, chopping it up with them. You know, whether it was over a beer or whether it was just sitting there with them, chopping it up, asking them, you know, if, if they were willing to assist. Now, I touched on this a little bit in episode 38 as well. But, you know, when I went out there to San Jose, Santa Clara, Campbell, that whole area out there. There was still a lot of fallout from a lot of the seas that had previously worked out there, similar to what I experienced out there in Salinas when. Rico and Lobo went on their little rip out there. You know, they discouraged a lot of homeboys, whacking Mike Eel, whacking some other little youngsters that got killed out there, killing little man. Those types of things that happened, it left a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths. You know, you guys got to understand, Salinas, the di dynamics of Salinas and the politics out there are very intricate. And I mean that seriously so there was like two different crews out there in salinas you had one crew were like smoky boxer Rocky martinez you had uh smoky all smoky's brothers and you know you had a, a chino chino smith patrick smith and you know there's a lot of them but smoky's house out there was literally like Everybody used to go to that house out there in Salinas. All the homies, that was the spot to go kick it. That was the place right there where everybody congregated. Smokey's house was the hangout spot. I mean, there was homeboys that would come over there that you, would, you wouldn't even know who they were unless you asked them. they just walk in, be sitting there. It was a big house. Be sitting there in the living room, be like, what's up, homie? What's your name? Where you from, bro? Oh, you're from the west side or from the east side. Oh, okay, you know, but everybody knew. A lot of the youngsters, when they were growing up, they all knew that Big Smokes, you know, that, that was the pad to go to. So, you know, coming up with Smokes, he had a, a lot of the homies out there respecting him, and a lot of them, a lot of the ones that were like-minded kicked it with him. And then you had another crew of individuals that weren't like those guys. They looked at him as they just didn't move like him. And that crowd was the Ricos, the Lobos, and those guys and their followers. Now, you know, when when you had that big split with 
you know, when Mike Eel got killed and Little Man got, Little Man was part of Smokey's crew. That was like, that was one of his guys. So when he got dropped, it was almost like, you know, that was one of us. You know, that was one of us that, that the NF took, you know, and those types of things that Smokey's pad used to be the spot where they'd all kick it over there and they'd all talk about it. Like, what are we going to do, man? We're going to, you know, we're going to continue to work with these dudes or, or, you know, let's just step back. And a lot of homies, you know, when, when those killings were happening out there, they'd meet up at Smokes and there was that big split. Smokey and them, you know, they're all carnales. And then you got Rico and Lobo and all them. When Mike Hill got whacked, they all went over there and Rico and Lobo were like, hey, man, we, you guys going to assist us in, you know, Sm Smokey and the, the other C's that were, you know, all behind him were like, no, nah, we're not we're not going to sling dope. We're not going to work with you guys like that. You guys need us as far as anything else. Call us and we'll be there. But, you know, as far as anything else now, nah, we're not we're not going to work with you guys. That's how it was. There was a serious split. Gopas was part of that, you know. They, they all opted to work with Gopas. You know, they seen Gopas as like, he was a target and Smokey and all of them decided to stand behind him and, you know, help him. They had to make a choice. They're, you know, Smokey and them were like, bro, you know, what should we do? Should we help him? And, you know, they're like, I think we should, man. You know, I think we should. And, you know, that's, that's that whole, that whole, power struggle that kind of happened out there and it, it's I'll go over it another time but you know a lot of that stuff I experienced it when I was out there in Salinas there was two crowds but the crowd that I kicked it with was Smokey you know Boxer Martinez and you know other guys like Pocky Wino a lot of those guys they got they got a lot of you know history and you know, they're deeply rooted in, in Salinas. Hockey, I believe his family was like the first, they were like the first criminals. The, the first family of all, all of them were all criminals that were involved in criminal activity out there, the, the Moros. Then you had, you had the Rochas. They were like, all of them were gangsters. They could, you know, the, the father was originally from Texas. He was, he was Texas syndicate. But, you know, the, the, the Rocha family, all of them were gangsters literally the whole family so you had families like that and just different kind of dynamics that you know that were part of selena's history that maybe sometime i'll get into that anyway i want to get off track but so let me see where what where was i at so okay so we spent the first couple weeks out there you know trying to just get ourselves rooted into a, that new area now when i first moved out there this came up in the comments too I didn't see any Sureño activity over there. Although that area right there in Pala, the street I was living on, and really Cadillac, that's where all the Sureños were at. But, you know, being that Impala is right there, that whole area is pretty much a stronghold for one of their hoods out there. But I never seen them in the beginning. You know, occasionally I see Sureño walk by or I see Sureño, you know, on a bike. Shout out to all the Southsiders, all the Upstaters. Or I see one go by on a bike. And, you know, I wouldn't say nothing. They look at me, I look at them, and I keep it pushing. You know, I never, I tried not to never do any kind of dirt on my doorstep, knowing that, you know, if I did something like that, they would come back to my pad, and my pad would be a target. So I didn't want to do nothing around there like that. I wasn't going to waste my time gangbanging, chasing little, you know, sureños in the neighborhood. Now, there was one individual that, it was a trip. Was a, I noticed him probably around a, a month after being out there. He lived like two complexes down. And, you know, his name ended up being Weddle. Later on, I did my, my investigation on him. And, you know, I looked into it. I did a little bit of research and, and found out who he was. And I'm not even sure it was it was true. But I believe at that time, what I had got back is that he might have been either a Mexican mafia associate or he was somebody out there with status that was had a little bit of of authority over the Sureños that were out there. So, you know, this guy was was Weddle complected. Obviously, they called him Weddle. 
He had a lot of tattoos. He was slung back with ink. He was probably around at that time. He was probably around my same age. At that time, I was like 30, 33. He had tattoos all over the back of his head. I couldn't see what those tattoos were, and I always try to see. Sometimes I'd be out there in front, and this guy, sometimes I catch him walking by. And what was the trip was, is he was always trying to hide the, the back of his, his head. I could I could tell he was. And I knew that because one time I was out there by the mailbox and he was walking up. I believe he was probably coming from the liquor store or something. And when he walked by me, instead of, you know, just continuing to walk, he put he looked up so that I couldn't read the back of his head. I knew what he was doing. I knew he was hiding, you know, the, whatever he, it said on the back of his head. I knew he didn't want me to see it. Later on, I, I ended up seeing it and it ended up being a suit 13. So, you know, he knew that I was a northerner, obviously, and they knew I was there for a while. And I would find this out later. I told you guys with the Sureño, I ended up getting him up with um, Triste. He would end up, you know, he ended up telling me all about, you know, that neighborhood out there and that they knew I was out there from the minute I moved in. And they had had meetings about trying to trying to hit me, trying to hit my pad which they eventually did, which you guys will hear about that again. So anyways, after the first three weeks of, of you know, kicking it with J-Lo, making phone calls and, and getting in touch with some homies, told you guys that, you know, at one point I ended up hooking up with Flacco. Flacco was somebody that I had previously worked with. This is when I was out there in Salinas. He was up under me. It was a special assignment. I was in Salinas and I was, functioning in the Salinas Regiment, but Skip, Corny, Pinky, they gave me a special crew to be up under me in San Jose. They wanted me to have a crew in San Jose for the whole, and their whole purpose was to just generate money to sling dope. So, you know, I had known Flacco from that, that previous time when I was out there and when he'd worked with me. So anyway, when I told you guys, he, he came by and, you know, we made our rounds out there in San Jose looking for certain individuals. I want to say it was me and him that went by Gato's store. It's his first name. I can't remember this cat's first name. I had it earlier, too. Anyways, his name, his last name is Marquez Gato. So he had a corner store out there that everybody in San Jose knows about. And, you know, we went over to that store. I made contact with them. And basically, I went out there and told them, hey, bro, I'm out here in San Jose now. So, you know, I know you were part of the regiment and these brothers want you to plug back in. So, you know, I'm going to get at you within a week or two after I take care of everything else I need to take care of. And, you know, I'll touch base with you then. So, you know, that's what I was doing out there. Now, it's a trip. I I had met I had met Gato another time. Probably it was probably like three years prior to that. At that time, I want to say I was living in Mendocino County and I, I came down for a meeting. And the whole purpose of the meeting was to talk about somebody that had flipped. And I can't even remember who it was. I can't, <laughs> but I ended up meeting, I know it was Charlie Campa, Gato was there, me, Smokey, and I think it was, no, you know what, the meeting was about Chico, it was about Chico, Robert Rose, the same individual I told you I ended up getting into with Lencho about in San Quentin when Lynch wanted to jump the gun and put his name, start filtering his name out there as being no good. And we didn't have all the details or the concrete details at that time. So, you know, I met Gato out there at that time and, and I'm not banging on the homie. I don't got nothing personal against him, but I, I always remember this situation. So when we went out there to, you know, to meet up with these guys in a hotel at that time, Everybody was suspect, but there was still a level of trust. The trust had gotten so bad within these last 10 years. It's pathetic. You know, guys reading, you know, uh, in prison, they're reading uh, people's personal mail, 
and just some of the things that they're doing, strip searching homeboy. Are you serious? I can't, I still can't believe that homeboys were strip searching other homeboys. This is something that I forget where I heard that from. One of the I want to say it was one of the CEOs that I interviewed on this channel that they they seen that, and this was for security purposes. That's wild. I don't know what the hell is going on there. But anyway, so what I was trying to say though is there was. You know, everybody was suspect at that time when we had that meeting because of Operation Black Widow. So, you know, we were everybody was just keeping their 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 eyes and ears open. You didn't know who to trust. You didn't know who was working with who. So when we would meet up like that, one of the one of the protocols was that we strip out before anything, turn the cell phones off, put them on the bed have all the cell phones up. So I remember when we got there, you know, me, I'm fresh out, I'm healthy. Smokey's fresh out, he's healthy. And I want to say, you know, Charlie Campo, he's never been a, a big dude, but he was healthy. But Gato, Gato was kind of heavy. And I just remember because when we, when we all, we stripped down to our boxers, like when homeboy came up out that shirt, I was like, damn, boy, better get on a treadmill home boy it was it was hilarious it was one of the things you got to be there man but anyway i don't know why that stood out to me but i remember when that happened me and Smokey just kind of looked at each other and was like damn you know what i'm saying i'm talking about you know when a motherfucker just when that panza is just hanging down to the kneecaps like just like a big old saggy theta you know what i'm saying <laughs> oh man anyway so once I ended up getting in touch with with Gato, that was I want to say he was one of the first ones that I had located out there. Now, one other individual that, and this was probably before I ended up hooking up with Flacco. I want to say there was one other individual that I hooked up with that also, you know, helped me establish myself out there. I mean, he played a big role in a lot of different ways. I'm not going to discuss all the different ways. I still got a lot of love and respect for the dude, but this was Spankio's brother, Spankio Cerna, the homeboy that got convicted to death row with Silencio and Wevel. And Spankio's the one that people say he committed suicide. Nobody knows, but, you know, rest in peace to the brother. But he's the one that passed away in San Quentin. He was on death row. They found him. Allegedly, they found him, you know, overdosed in his cell. So, you know, Hugo was somebody that was real close with J-Lo. She was like a brother-in-law to him. They were all kind of tied in together because, you know, Silencio and Spunky were on death row together. So their families were, were tight. Their, their wives were, you know, kind of family. So Hugo would always come over there and she'd end up introducing me to him. And like I said, he helped me. There was a lot of things that Homeboy was like, you know what? I got this. I got that for you. He was like, you know, I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you just to help you. I, I respect what you're doing. And, you know, that's what I did. Now, the other thing I did for him, and I don't care about talking about it now, you know, it's a wrap, but, you know, it don't matter because Spunky is no longer around. But one of the things that, you know, Hugo needed help with was sending a, a care package to Spunky at that time. And they wanted, you know, to open up stuff and, 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 this is when we used to be able to send outside packages. They stopped it all now. But when you used to be able to send a, a personal care package to somebody that was locked up in prison, you know, you'd open up the M&Ms and you were able to put stuff in there. You take open up the cookies, put stuff in there, seal it up. As long as you knew what you were doing, you took your time, sealed it up. Uh, you know, I had a the other reason why he needed my help is because I had one of those, you know, those uh they're sealers. They're what do they call them? Air to air, where they basically seal anything airtight. You can, you know, you buy them and, and you heat seal your your meats and 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 all that stuff. Well, that's what we used to, you know, facilitate that package. Anyway, so Hugo was somebody else that played a big role out there and. You know, I remember at one time, and this this happened before, or it might have happened. It, no, it did happen before. This happened before I took all that counterfeiting equipment 
from that individual that was out there. Smiley in San Jose, the one that we caught, we went to his house. Me and Flocka went to his house and I pressed him and I took all his equipment. So, you know, what I was going to say is Hugo had a hundred dollar bill that was counterfeit. And at that time I was looking for anything and everything that I could get my hands on as far as to give me a jump start. Glavo, money, whatever it was, guns, I needed everything. So he showed me a $100 bill that was counterfeit. And I looked at it and I was like, damn, this is, this is quality, bro. Like, like, where did you get that? And he was like, he was like, you know, I know a homie that's printing it. And so there was other people out there that were printing at that time. Now, speaking of that, so at this time, I had all that equipment that I had took from that individual. I want to say his name Smiley again. This is the same guy that called me from the county jail. And, you know, I knew he had bad intentions. Then his girl called and I knew she had bad intentions. I want to say that they were trying to set me up on the phone. But I had all that equipment. But I, I needed somebody, you know, to help me. I didn't, I didn't have no knowledge as far as how to print counterfeit or how to how to generate counterfeit. I, I knew as much as anybody else. I mean, I, any 12 year old can take a bill and put it on a, a printer and, and photocopy. It. That's pretty much all I knew. So I needed somebody that had the, you know, the, the know-how, the skills in order to use that equipment. So that's what I was also looking for. Now, at one point when, when we were out there trying to find individuals that were part of the, the regiment, we went by an individual by the name of Larry Santos' house. We went over there and, you know, prior to getting there, Flacco told me, he's like, hey, I can introduce you to this homie. He's a solid dude. He's a little baller. You know, he's somebody that functions. He's functioned with other carnales that were out here before. I know he helped Bad Boy. I know he helped, I want to say, Weicho. So, you know, he's a solid dude. So I'm like, yeah, bro, let's go. Let's go up. Uh, let's go hook up with him. So, we drove over to his house and I still remember it like it was yesterday. It was a hot ass day out there in San Jose. And when we walked up, the front door was kind of, it was open a little bit. And you could see when we were walking up to his door, you could see homeboy sitting on his couch. He was on the phone. So we walked in and, you know, we sat down, homeboy finished up his conversation and we started chopping it up. He introduced us. And, you know, from the from the gate, I took a liking to Larry, just his stilo, the way that he carried himself. He was a youngster. He was, you know, at that time he was striving. And, you know, he was somebody that he was a believer and he was willing to help. He was willing to assist. There was no ifs, ands, buts about it. I told him what I was out there trying to do. And he was like, hey, I'm all for it, bro. You know, I got this. I got that. This is what I can help with. And so. The youngster had good business acumen. He had a lot of things going on. He had his hands in a lot of different things. And when I met him, the first thing that I that you know I said to myself was, this dude has a lot of resources that I need to tap into. I mean, he was running stuff, running chemicals to and from Mexico. He worked with some other individuals, some other connections that were working with some connections that were millionaires that I had known previously. Well, the Blancos, I'll say it. The Blancos, it wasn't necessarily the Blancos, but it was somebody the Blancos was, were, was working with, a guy by the name of Big Bird. And this dude was, at one point in time, I want to say, he was slinging a lot of KG out there in San Jose, and it was on that level. Like they got busted with, I want to say a quarter million, but that's, that's the kind of weight that he was pushing. So Larry was well-versed in all that. He knew the chemicals. He still had a lot of the plugs. He was running dope to and from Mexico. He had a car that was equipped with different compartments to, to put dope in. It, it was crazy, man, the way that they had it hooked up. So in order to get into some of these compartments, you had to like press the air conditioning and like the lights at the same time and a compartment would pop open. You know, it was a small sealed compartment that was like in the back seat when one of the, one of the little side, uh, 
like inside the door. There was compartments, like two or three in that car right there. So, you know, when we started working together, the plan was is I was going to get another car and we were going to equip that car with, with compartments as well. And we were both going to start running dope to him from Mexico. Now, like I said, this dude was pushing chemicals and I'm going to get into it in a little bit, but at one point I had a five count, five gallon drum of bromahide. For any of you that know what bromahide is, it, it's straight chemicals, but it was a five gallon drum that I had got. And I sat on it for a while, but that's, that's where the money's at. We're talking like, you know, full drums, grade A type chemicals that go for a lot of money. I'm not even sure how much money that, that drum was, was worth. I had to get rid of it later. Broke my heart, but I did when I got raided. Anyway, so me, me, and, me and Larry, we would start working together. After we got introduced, you know, Flock would end up catching a, a, a gun case or something. Not long after we hooked up, I want to say it was only two or three weeks after, and so he was gone. That was the last time I would ever see him again until late years later. So me and Larry, we started kicking it. You know, we kicked it from morning to night, man. Uh, I'd be at his pad, he'd be at my pad, and we'd be out there just in the mix, you know, running dope. And at that time, he was slinging a lot of a lot of crystal and a lot of weed. But now, the one thing that it was a perfect situation is we started talking about something and counterfeit came up and I had asked him about it if he knew about, you know, how to do it. And that was his forte. It was it couldn't have been a more perfect situation. So when, when, when I heard that, I'm like, damn, this is what I need right here, bro. You know what I mean? So I tell him I got all this equipment at my pad. We make, you know, arrangements to go to my apartment at a certain day during the week so that we could just spend the whole day knocking knocking it out. So the day that he comes over, he brings his girl with him. He had a ride or die. She was down with him, you know. He was, she was, everything he was doing, she was right there with him. That's the kind of female she was. I had a lot of respect for her as well. So we go to my apartment. I show him all the equipment and, you know, I don't want to get too much into this, but I'm just going to say this. So a lot of the equipment that I had was, or that this guy had that I took, a lot of it was just low level type of stuff. It was a computer screen, just the, the, the brains of the computer and all that stuff. The one thing that was pretty much everything was the printer. We had a Lexmark. I forget what it was. I know it was a it was a laser printer. But those printers at that time were the best printers that you could use for counterfeiting. Everybody knew it at that time. This is 2003, 2004. Now, at that time, you know, counterfeiting, a lot of people were still into counterfeiting and they hadn't put a lot of the security features on the bills that they would later that would stop you from printing them. In, in other words, so like at that time, so we weren't printing no low level type of counterfeit. We were pr printing some quality stuff. So this is what we were doing. So your lowest denomination of bills are obviously one dollar bills. However, $1 bills do not have the strip that goes through them, that little strip. If you hold it up to the light, you can see like on $5 bills, there's a strip. Well, ones don't do it. So ones are no good. What we would do is we use $5 bills. $5 bills have that little strip. They also have the watermarks. So the process was is you go to Craigins, any kind of auto parts store, and you get some of that that purple degreaser it's in a big purple container and you know you get some cookie sheets you pour it in the cookie sheets and you drop your bills in there you flatten them all out and you just drop them in so that they're saturated you let them sit for about 15 20 minutes take some latex gloves put your gloves on and then you just lightly just do that to the bills you just kind of like just pushing the ink off and eventually all the ink will come off 
you know, you don't want to do it too hard or too much because when you start to do that, it starts to fray and you start getting like the little lint balls. You don't want to do that. You mess the paper up. So you just do it real lightly and take your time. When you're doing this, the type of time and effort that you put into your work is going to determine what kind of bills you're going to get. So, you know, after you do that, then there's a bath, a wash that you put them in and you know, you run them through that. And when you're done at that point, all you have now is just clean bills. You have bills, white bills with no paper on them. So you, you hang those out, you let them, you let them dry. Now, the hard part is making a template. Making a template is one of the hardest parts and probably one of the most important. Because if you make a template that's crooked or it's off, you know, the 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 print is going to come off wrong. You're going to see the edges are not going to look right. They got to be clean. They got to be clean. And, you know, everything's got to be lined up just right. If not, just with the naked eye, you're going to see like the same. This, this is counterfeit. So when you make the template, you know, you take a, a thin piece of something like a plastic, like plastic, a hard plastic is probably the best thing. And you cut out using an exacto knife. So one of the hardest parts, like I said, is cutting out like a rectangle shape that will, you know, just big enough for the bill. And what you're going to do is you're going to tape the bills over those for the for the print. And I want to say it's scanned on. That's the part I didn't understand how to scan it to line it up perfectly so that it go right where you have, you know, the, the bill lined up on the template. That was the part that I was having a hard time understanding how to do. But Larry knew how to do all that. Even his girl knew how to do all that. So we sat there for literally six, seven, eight hours that whole day until the night, just printing out bills. And like I said, again, the time and effort that you put into your work is going to determine the quality of bills that you're going to get. You take the time and, you, you know, you put a lot of work into it. You're going to get quality bills. And that's what we got. You know, you got to take them print them, then you got to take them off, turn them over, tape them again, and then run them back through, do the front and the back. So it's time consuming. Anyway, the bills were were so quality. They were so such high quality bills at that time that, you know, I was taking them out there to people on the streets and I was selling a thousand dollars worth for 600 cash and people were eating them up. They were like, they would look at it and be like, hell yeah. You know, people had, I think I got one somewhere, a, a pin, one of those pin tests that you, you would be able to use back in those days to determine whether or not it was real paper. But, you know, it passed the pin test because it was on real paper. And, you know, to the naked eye, the ink was, was on point. It was the same color. The bill was the same texture. Everything lined up. You had the the strip, and you also had the watermark. Now, the only thing about it is if you were dealing with somebody legit and they were checking bills, the only downfall that you would have is you're using a $5 bill. Obviously, if you're printing a $50 bill and you're using a $5 bill, you're going to have Abraham Lincoln watermark when there should be a grant. Or, you know, you're doing a a five dollar bill you're printing a hundred dollar bill on a five dollar bill you you know somebody holds it up they're going to look and they're going to see a, a lincoln a abraham lincoln where there should be a franklin you know what i'm saying so that's the only downfall me myself i was dumping a lot of it on the streets through connections and people like that that just wanted to buy it up going through legitimate businesses that was something that i i, I stayed away from initially because you know i looked at it as like counterfeiting it's messy there's a lot it leaves a paper trail and just there's a lot of different ways a lot of different scenarios where you get caught up so i left that alone or in the beginning you know i played it smart by like i said dumping it on the street now eventually i ended up breaking my own policies and that's something that you don't do man you guys know that you set policies or you have a sixth sense about something or a gut feeling about something, stick with it. Don't deviate. That's what I did. You know, my thing was I would stay away from legitimate businesses, but eventually I started testing my luck. Now, one of the first times I did that, there was a female that I had met previously. 
out there in San Jose. And once again, I can't get away from this dude. <laughs> Me and Smokey went out to San Jose to meet up with none other than yours truly, Lencho. So we meet up with him and we're at the place and we, we met a couple females. So I met this female out there. I'm not even going to say her name. And because I've talked to her since then and it's no longer an issue. But at the time, you know, I, I met her, I met her out there in San Jose at the place. And a couple years later, when all this happened, I, you know, I ran into her again out there in San Jose and she wanted an opportunity to make some money. So I was like, look, I got a couple thousand dollars worth of some counterfeit, you know, I'll drive you over to this Best Buy. You go in, you get some equipment that I want, and you know I'll break you off. That was that was the thing. So she was down with it. Now I'm not gonna get too much into this, but I, I'll tell you guys a quick little story about what happened. So you know we agreed to the way that it was gonna work is I pull up to the parking lot with her. She gets out. She goes in there. I was going to walk in five minutes after, which I did, and act like I was just another customer looking through stuff. And when I seen some stuff that I wanted, I like pointed out to her in there, which I did. I showed her a couple of things that I wanted. I didn't go in there and talk to her. I just kind of like looked at her and was like, hey, that right there. So she knew what I wanted. And as soon as I pointed everything out, it was like $3,000 worth of equipment. I cut. I left. I went back out to the parking lot. So I go back to the car and I'm sitting in, I think at that time I had my truck. I'm sitting in the truck and I'm waiting. Five minutes go by, 10 minutes go by, 15 minutes. And I'm like, man, what the hell is she doing? So 20 minutes goes by and I'm like, man, I'm getting ready to go into the store and look for her now. I'm starting to trip. It, it don't take that long. Right when I got ready to get out the car, San Jose PD came flying up, four cars. Four cars for some counterfeiting. Yeah, that's right. So they come flying up, right? They all go run. They run into to Best Buy. And they, you know, I can't, obviously I couldn't see what they were doing, but it was, it wasn't, it wasn't hard to figure it out. When I seen them, I started up the my truck and I, I got up out of there. So anyway, I go home. I'm tripping now. I'm like, man, I wonder what happened. I blow, I blew up her cell phone. She's not answering. So I was just like, you know, I'll find out eventually what happened. I called her pad. Her kids said that they didn't know where she was at. So I couldn't find her. Now, later on that night, she calls me. She calls me and she's like, hey, she's like, uh, I'm over here on the east side. She's like, don't trip. You know, nothing happened. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? How? How is that? She goes, she goes, well, when I was in there, she goes, they obviously, they got suspicious when I handed them the bills because she, she kept them in the envelope. Like, a, I don't know why she did it like that, but she kept them in a white envelope. Then she pulled all that money out. That just looked kind of funny. So it made the dude look kind of look at the bills a little bit closer. And, you know, when you, when you look at them closer, like I said, that's when you're going to find, you know, find out that they're counterfeit. So at that point, they call the cops. Cops come, they gaff her up, bring her to the back room, according to her, sit her down. And, you know, they got her there for like 15, 20 minutes while they're doing their little investigation. According to her, the cops, one of them, well, one of them liked her is what she told me. And. You know, he was talking about letting her go. But when they walked into the front, up to the front, they left her sitting back there by herself. She said she went out the back door, jumped the fence like Rambo, seen one of her homeboys driving by with his old lady, flagged him down, jumped in the car and went to their house. She got to their house and she fell asleep on the couch. Which pretty much accounted for everything that happened in her mind, because this accounted for why she didn't call me. She fell asleep and how she got away. She went out the back door, jumped the fence like Rambo. And so I'm like, serious? I'm like, man, that sounds funny. I didn't tell her that, but I'm like, so you you, you ran out the back door, you seen a homie, you flagged him down, you jumped the fence, you got on and then you, you fell asleep on your homeboy's couch. 
I'm like, okay. I'm like, well, cool, man. I'm glad you glad you didn't get caught. You know, don't worry about the money. Um, it's it's no big thing, man. You know, so it is what it is. Now, later on that that same no, it was the next morning. So, but later on that night, I talked to another homie, and you know, I had explained to him what happened, and he was like, "Bro, that sounds that sounds fishy, bro." And I'm like, "Man, I'm already knowing, but how else am I gonna find out?" And he's like, "Man, maybe you can call and see, you know, maybe you can call bail bonds or something and see if there's some kind of way you can find out if she got arrested or something." And I'm like, "Well." You know, I'm sure it'll come up if something did, man. Well, the next morning, homeboy calls me back and he tells me, bro, go get the newspaper. Go get the San Jose Mercury and look on page six in the local section. So, you know, I'm like, what is it, bro? And he's, you know, what is it, man? Tell me what it is. I'll go get the paper. But what he goes, your girl's in there, bro. So I'm like, nah, he's like, I swear to God, homie. So anyway, I go get the paper, go down to the liquor store, get the paper and <laughs> Honestly, it was a pretty big article for just somebody getting caught in San, in the San Jose area for some counterfeit. There was an article that says San Jose woman, you know, her age and all that, her, and her name was arrested at such and such address, Best Buys. You know, she went in, tried to make a purchase of several thousand dollars worth of high grade or high end equipment. The employees basically sniffed her out or they, you know, they, they were suspicious of the money, so they called the cops, which then led to her arrest. She was booked in the county jail, arrested, and her bail was set at whatever. And then I want to say it said something about later on, SSU sat her down and talked to her about the origins or, or something like that to that effect of where the money came from. And I'm like, damn. So I call her back. I call her and I'm like, hey, so, you know, you told me you fell asleep on the, on the homeboy's, on your homeboy's couch, right? She's like, yeah. I'm like, tell me why a newspaper article came out this morning with your name in it. Why are they saying you got arrested? And hey, I, I, I get it, man. When you lie, stick to your guns till the wheels fall off and keep on lying. And that's what she tried to do. She was like, I don't know. You know, there's an article. It, it wasn't me. There must be somebody else, but I didn't get busted. I'm telling you straight up. I can introduce you to the dude. You can call him, talk to him, talk to his wife, talk to his dog. And you know what I mean? They'll all tell you that I was there and I, that I fell asleep. And I'm like, all right, man, it's all good. You know, so I just, I left it alone. From that point on though, I never called her back. But I would end up seeing her years later after everything kind of played out in different circumstances. I'm like, you know what? It's not even a big deal. It is what it is. But that that situation right there, actually, it's it, it generated somewhat of an investigation that kind of got put up on a shelf for a minute. But later on, somebody would start looking into that and it would kind of start turning into a bigger investigation. So. Let me just go over these other two incidents real quick just to tell you guys, you know, how I got kind of sloppy and messy with this stuff, man. So, again, I started I broke my policies by going to legitimate stores with this stuff. One time, you know, I had I had a dog at that time and I used to get a lot of stuff for the dog at this local pet store that was right there in Campbell, right down the street from off of Winchester. I want to say it's Petco or something like that. So I had been in there a few times. On this one particular time, I go in there and I'm like, you know what? I had like $2,500 worth of counterfeit on me. I'm like, I'm just going to buy a big ass fish tank, buy all kinds of, you know, fish and, and all the equipment and all that, spend like two grand. So that's what I did. I bought all kinds of stuff. And, you know, I pay for it. Now, the other thing I used to do is this real quick. Whenever I would go into a legitimate establishment like this, I would pick my tellers. I would look at them. I wouldn't just go up to any register. I'd look for usually somebody that was young and that looked like maybe a, a college kid or somebody that was still in school or something like that. It was always the older cats that would always look at the bills and want to hold them up and look at them and pull the pen out and swipe them and, and 
just do extra stuff. So I used to stay away from them and I would pick my targets. Anyway, that's what it was at the Petco this time. It was a, a youngster. And the other thing I would do is when I would hand them the bills, I just I start short talking to them. Hey, what's up, man? You look familiar. Did you used to go to school over here off of such and such? And what year did you graduate? And I'm just trying to throw them off track, keep them distracted. And for the most part, it worked. So anyways, I go in there, I buy all that stuff, spend about two grand, and I dip out. About a week later, I'm driving by with Vicky, and we needed something for the dog. Maybe it was food or something. I'm not sure. But whatever it was, I was like, you know, whenever I would, another one of my policies that I broke is whenever I would go to a store and I would pass counterfeit, I would never go back to that store from that point on. But this was the only pet co in that area. So when we were driving by, I, I hesitated, but I was like, nah, I'm, they're not, they're not going to trip. So I went back over there. I don't stand out. I don't think I stand out. I think I look like everybody else. Anyway, I go to the Petco. I go up in there and I get what I'm what I'm gonna get. And again, I ignore my sixth sense. I see the employees looking at me like they're just looking at me like they know me or something, or they're trying to figure me out. I should have dipped right there, but I didn't. I stayed in line. And I'm just like, oh, maybe they're just maybe they think I'm still in. They're just watching me. I don't know. So. I get up to the register. I pay for it. As soon as I'm walking out, I got my little dog food or whatever. So I'm walking out. Campbell PD swoops up. They jump out on me. End up cuffing me up. They took my bag, told me that I was just being detained, that they were doing a lightweight investigation because I was being accused of committing a crime in the past at that Petco. So I, I dummy up. I'm playing dumb. Like, what? What are you talking about? When they grab my bag, I'm like, and again, I knew what they were doing, but I'm trying to play dumb. I'm like, you guys think I'm stealing everything in that bag? I paid for it. So if they're thinking I stole something in there, man, they're crazy. You know what I mean? And they're like, no, nah, it's got nothing to do with this. It's something that happened a couple of weeks ago. And I'm like, a couple of weeks ago? I'm like, man, everything that I've ever went in, I bought from this store, I paid for it. So you know, one, one of them went inside and talked to the employees and he ended up coming out and he's like, you know what? They said that you came through about two weeks ago and that you passed around twenty five hundred dollars worth of counterfeit. So. You know, that's that's where we're at. And they're like, you got any money on you right now? And I'm like, yeah, I, I do. And they're like, where's it at? It's in my front pocket. So they pull out a wad. I had about two racks on me that day. All small pills, man. So they pull out this wad and they're like, damn, do you always carry that kind of money around? Yeah, man, I just got paid. You just got paid. What do you do? I'm I work uh I I, I forget what I told them, construction or something. But anyway, so luckily that day I didn't have no counterfeit on me. All the bills were legit. They went through every single bill, one by one on the on the hood. And you know, at the conclusion, they're like, OK, look, there's all these are, are, are legit bills. But I'm going to tell you like this. We're going to let you go because we can't really do nothing right now. But you're going to be getting a phone call in the near future from some guys in suits, because, you know, if if you pass some counterfeit bills to this store, you know, I, I'd advise you not to do it again. And again, I continue to play dumb. I'm like, I'm going to tell you like this. If I pass any counterfeit bills to this store. It was because they were in circulation and they came through my hands and I didn't know that they were counterfeit. I didn't knowingly go in any store and, pa and, and pass counterfeit. That's not what I do, man. So anyways, that situation right there, it, it, it spooked me to the point to where I went home that same day, got rid of everything, the printers, the computers, everything, that the templates, the ink, everything. I threw it all in the garbage. Didn't want nothing else to do with it. The way I was looking at it is if they come from this point on, they get a search warrant or whatever, I'm not going to have none of that equipment. So that was the end of my counterfeiting days at that point. There was one other incident that, you know, that I, I, I was involved in. It's not even worth talking about. 
I got away with it, but I was just playing myself close by doing it. Anyways, so, you know, once once I stopped counterfeiting and, you know, I got rid of all the equipment, me and Larry, at that point, we're just out there in San Jose slinging a lot of weed and a lot of, a lot of crystal, like I said. And, you know, Larry put me in pocket. He gave me like a pound just to, you know, help get get the regiment money the regiment money not my personal money but the money to start the regiment up and on track to, to try to help me with it so you know i got that i flipped it with the assistance of a couple cats that you know i had already hooked up with at that time gato was one of them and you know through larry i would end up coming into contact with Pony. Now, if you guys don't know who Pony is, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you right now. And then this would be a good time to stop this one and start the next one. But basically, Pony is the individual that I ended up meeting him in San Quentin a couple years prior, or it wasn't even a couple years. I want to say it was probably about a year prior. So some of you might remember this situation, some of you might not, but I'm gonna run it by you guys again. So I'm in San Quentin. Well, I think I already talked about it. About I remember something about my handwriting being distinctive. Okay, so I already covered it. So I, I'm going to spare you guys. So Pony was the one that got caught up. Yeah, I did mention it. And I remember we all got charged. Well, they got charged with conspiracy to commit murder. When I put that green light on that cat that was getting released out of C-section. Anyways. Pony was one of the ones that ended up staying a couple days past his release date, and then they end up kicking him loose a few days after. So by chance, Larry ended up knowing Pony. So he put me in touch with Pony. Pony came by, and you know, I'm, I'll be honest, even though I don't got no love for the dude no more, I took a liking to him just because he was another one that was like. He was ready to, to work with me and he was ready to, to give me kind of whatever kind of assistance I needed. He's like, bro, I'm out here. Homie, I know you're by yourself. You're, you're hurting for resources. You don't got, you know, no help out here. I'm with you, bro. Whatever you need, man, you know, I'm right here with you if, if you know, you want me to work with you. So right away, I embraced him. I embraced him and he was somebody that I brought into the regiment. He wasn't somebody that previously worked with the regiment. I recruited him. He was one of the only ones I recruited at that time. So, you know, I would end up making him my second in command. And a lot of people question that because Pony wasn't the type of hermano that done that kind of time, like a lot of whole time or shoe time. And he wasn't somebody that had been in a lot of leadership type of positions. But the way I looked at it was he had a good mind on his, on a good head on his shoulders. He had, good business acumen as well. You know, he had a lot of vision. He helped me pursue a lot of things that I was trying to get done out there. So I slid him up into my into my second in command. And, you know, this would even, I, he would even remain in that position after individuals like Sykes. You know, once I locate Sykes from Goshen and his brother, Angel, Really, Sykes should have slid in as my second in command. But like I said, I, I kept Pony there because I didn't think that there was any reason to, you know, to rock the boat at the time. So so once I got Pony working with me, you know, Pony knew a lot of individuals out there as well. Larry knew a lot of individuals and he was he had a lot of contacts. So both of them kind of helped me find all everybody that I needed to get in touch with. I had Sykes and his brother, Angel, they came in. Turtle from 9-5 was another hermano that had previously worked with the regiment. He was, his cousin, Baby G, was Baby G from Metal Fair. He was another one that was working with the regiment prior. So those individuals came in. Willow was somebody I knew from San Quentin. So you know, later on, I'd find out that he was part of that regiment. I ended up locating him. Lonnie Marquez, sniper from San Jose, is another hermano that was out there. He got brought into the regiment. Al, Big Al, 
I don't remember his last name, but he was somebody else that, that came in. You had Maro, Maro from, from San Jose, somebody, again, I knew from San Quentin. You had another homeboy named, I'm just going to call him V. I'm not even going to mention his name because he's somebody else that doesn't want to be mentioned on social media. He came in, then there was another little homie, Short Day. I want to say that's pretty much around, that's pretty much around everybody at that time. So, you know, at, at, at the time, there was probably like 15 of us that were working out there at any given time, 15 or 20, somewhere around there. So at this time, you know, as I'm meeting these guys, I bring them by the pad. I bring them by my house. I sit them down. I go over, you know, the policies with them, the expectations, the things that I expect from them. You know, I, I pretty much go over everything with them. And, you know, if they don't know Pony, I introduce him as, as my second in command. Basically, he's my buffer, the one that will be getting in touch with them on a daily basis. You know, I go over everything with them. They're required to punch in once in the morning and once at night. The, all the policies dealing with dope, the policies dealing with, you know, conduct, the drinking policies, the dope policies, everything. I mean, I go over everything with them. With Pony, you know, as a, a secondary mouthpiece, even though he had never been in those positions and he had never worked in a regiment, he understood a lot of the stuff. It's not that complicated. But, you know, we were able to sit all these guys down and go over everything with them and get it done. So, Maro was somebody that was only out there for a brief a brief time in San Jose. He was somebody that I was with in Quentin, but he worked with me for about two weeks. And he would end up getting caught. I want to say he got caught with a gun and some of the regiment dope. He ends up hitting the county jail. He's stressed out because... He gets caught with regiment money, and now he's in debt. You know, I wasn't the kind of C that would put my foot on these guys' neck and, and ride them. You know, they got busted with regiment dope. I understood that they were out there trying to, they were out there making a sacrifice for the regiment, and they were out there putting in work for us. So, you know, to sit there and ride them once they're already locked up, some of them might be looking at the third strike or looking at a grip of time. I'm not going to put that extra you know, wait on him, be like, hey, bro, you know, aside from all the other problems that you got right now going on in your life, you also got a $500 debt that you need to pay. You know, getting them at their worst time where they're probably going to end up having to ask their mother or, you know, take food off their kids' table to pay that back, which happens all the time I've seen it. Anyways, Mato ends up getting busted and he ends up in the county jail in debt. I basically tell him not to worry about it, to fight his case, not to trip. I'll cover it. However, the, it's relevant. You know, the, the reason why I'm talking about him being in the jail is because once he got in the jail, Motto asserted himself and tried, basically tried to take over the jail. And I believe, you know, he had good intentions, but I think because he was working with me, he felt like he had that status through me. If that makes sense to you guys, you know, I I would end up hearing multiple stories from guys that were coming out of the jail that model was in there causing chaos, that he was in there trying to take the jail over and that he was telling everybody that he was up under B boxer from San Fran. And I was like, oh, man, we need to get a hold of this dude and, and you know, shut him down and and. and kind of, you know, clarify some things with him because he's obviously, I know he's got good intentions, but, you know, we what he's doing is wrong. And there was somebody al already there that was in charge of the county jail. And I would find this out later. And, you know, I ended up getting in touch with that individual through model. Anyway, so they, were, they had a little lightweight power struggle going on in the jail until I fi found out about it, until I was able to get somebody to pass my number to model and have him call me. So he called me and, you know, I had him put me in touch with the other individual that he was bumping heads with, which ended up being Joel Beta. Joel Beta was somebody that I had been with in Pelican Bay. I've been with him in San Quentin. You know, I had an immense amount of respect for him. He was a solid brother. I would end up 
you guys will hear about him later more, but I would end up spending a lot of time with him in the jail. But, you know, through him, I had it were through me, I had him running the jail. So once I shut model down, Joe would call me daily about county business, stuff, county jail stuff. And all this stuff would come out later in the indictment because they would find out about it through the recorded phone calls. But, you know, Joe would call me about, and they used to call him a Tommy. It's a Nawa name. But, you know, Joe would tell me about situations that were happening in the jail. And although he tried to talk cold, a lot of it was easy to decipher. But, you know, when somebody needed to get removed or something like that, he'd get at me and I'd give him the either the, the thumbs up or the thumbs down. There was investigations going on that, you know, may, mainly, you know, I told I told Joe that I wanted him to run the jail. I wanted him to run the jail and feel confident enough that he could do it with my blessings that I, I really didn't want to be bothered with the petty stuff. The, the small daily, the day-to-day -day affairs, I expected him to be able to handle that. Not to come and get at me about stuff that he shouldn't really have to get at me about, stuff he was able to deal with. Now, other things that were, were you know, when it came to removing somebody, somebody's status or an investigation, something like that, things that were a little bit above his head, those are the things that I told him to get at me about because I didn't want to be bothered with the jail and the streets. I had my hands full working on the streets out there in San Jose trying to establish that you know, regiment as, as it was. So anyways, at this point right here, you know, Larry ends up getting busted. He caught a, like I said, he caught a gun case with some dope, you know, but in the meantime, in between time, he ended up put me in pocket. By then I had a good amount of dope that I was flipping. So the money started coming in and this is when I started sending money to the brothers over there in Santa Rita at that time. I was already to the point to where I had my manpower plugged in. Everybody was starting to kick in their $200 commission for the month. That money was coming in. And then we had, you know, our criminal activities at that time was almost exclusively selling methamphetamine. There were some situations out there that can be construed as extortion that we were involved in, you know, then the counterfeiting for a minute and some other other things that we dabbled in. But, you know, the money started flowing to these guys now. And it started out, it started out small. It was a couple thousand. You got to start somewhere. But eventually it would end up being thousands, thousands of dollars. So, so I want to say it was Gato, but I'm not sure. It was either Gato or Dimitri. So one day I'm out there on this, you know, out there in, in Campbell. I'm still at that same apartment. And I get a phone call from, like I said, either Gato or Dimitri. And they're stressed out because they ended up catching a case and they're in the jail. And they don't know if the cops are going to go by and search their pads. So what, what what they wanted me to do was, is they had a five gallon drum of bromide chemicals that you use to, to cook dope with. So whoever it was was like, hey, B, I got this five gallon drum over there. He's like, bro, you can have it or, you know, I'm just going to dump it. It's worth fucking, it's worth a lot of money, bro. If you get it, you know, you can sling it and you can keep the money or maybe slide me like five five racks or whatever. But you know, if you don't pick it up, I'm to the point where I'm just going to, I'm going to get rid of it. I'm going to have my lady dump it because I don't know if they're going to go buy the pad and I need to get it out there, get it out of there ASAP. So I'm like, yeah, I'll pick it up, bro. So you know, I drove out to a, a storage somewhere out there in San Jose to a storage area or one of those store, public storage places. And I met his old lady and she gave me the five gallon drum. And I remember putting that thing in my carport inside of my, my locker out there. It was worth a lot of money, but I wasn't going to keep those kind of high-grade chemicals inside my apartment. You know, I didn't know enough about them. You know, if you could get sick from inhaling it, if it was safe, I didn't know enough, enough or I wasn't comfortable enough having them in the apartment at that time like that. So, 
you know, at that point, I just kept him in the carport until later. And, you know, I was trying to find somebody that was interested in just buying the whole gallon instead of, you know, trying to sell a little bit here and there. So anyways, I think this is probably a good time to cut this episode off right here. I know, you know, it's kind of all over the place, but I'm trying to get to where a, a part to where, you know, I'm more grounded and I'm, you know, certain things are happening out there and things are starting to get dicey, you know. Anyways, you guys, inner demons, you know, we still got a ways to go, but I'm going to keep it real with you guys, man. Once we get to the point to where I'm in the county jail, unless I start like really elaborating on stuff and going in depth about things that happen, which I will, you know, it's going to end pretty quick because we're already up to 2004. You know, we've already cut through like 30 30 something years already and i know i could have elaborated on a lot of stuff a lot more stuff than i have in these episodes but again once i get up to a point to where i'm almost done with inner demons what i'm gonna probably do is i'm probably gonna back up and reflect back on things that i didn't talk about just to keep inner demons going you know because once it comes to an end then we're gonna move on to something else an another series so I'm going to try to, you know, draw it out for as long as I can. We'll see what happens. Anyways, you guys, this episode 49, this your boy B. I hope you guys enjoyed the content and I'm out.